Welcome to episode 50 of Dispersing the Cloud. Um, I'm still off social media. I'm still doing all of these um, not live videos and uh, they're actually going to go up on my private YouTube here um, this weekend. And uh, they're probably going to all be released around the same time. My assumption is the end of January. I will be back to uh, the social media world and back to doing these um, live. As of now, I'm talking to myself like a crazy person. Um, <laughs> so this is episode 50. Um, I've blasted through more than 50 books um, over this year. I believe I'm to 60 by now. I haven't done a full count. I'll do a count uh, before the New Year's episode, um, and definitely before January, before you guys see me again. Um, let me hop to my calendar and uh, make sure I'm giving you guys a recap. I'm still doing construction in Ukiah, and I'm still doing the fire cleanups. That's kind of what's been going on in my world. Let me see what the date is today. I don't care what the date says. It's a movie quote from Zoolander. If you're not familiar with it, you should watch that movie. Um, so yeah, I've been working fires. Uh, we, we kind of took a little, they're having contract issues. So, um, they put us on private work, which I'm not stoked about. Um, I can, I can do private work anywhere and, and make a normal wage. I'm really uh, postponing my trip to Missouri, uh, to make, um, substantial, substantial income, um, during this time here, you know, I'm really just trying to knock out the debt that I have from the projects that have been um, leaning hard on 2017 and, and the hole that I put myself in and I was knocking it out really quickly um, and then we got put on private work and uh, I'm trying to make some moves to make that kind of uh, change a little bit for me um, and then we had that week off but I'm still making massive progress in that area finding while well, doing private work it's tough to find time to read um or listen and um i was able to knock out a book uh and that book let me pull it up here i'm going off my notes here oh it says that i have no emails uh it's a liar there we go uh it's pot liquor poppers by john t edge um this book was really interesting but it wasn't what I expected. So uh, I expected it to be slightly a nutritional book, slightly a history book, and um, it ended up being a revision of history via food. So it went through basically the civil rights era till now, um, all based around cuisine. And so it ended up being extraordinarily um extraordinarily interesting it just wasn't what I expected um, and I didn't gain much from it from the perspective of me being able to utilize a lot of the information I know a lot about um, southern cooking and culturally how that evolved um, it was actually cool we, uh, they talked a little bit about um, Kentucky Fried Chicken and um, and how uh, he actually sold the recipe and then um, I think felt guilty for changing um, changing the style of southern fried foods um, but yet made his millions off of it and um, the persona of um, Colonel Sanders wasn't actually the persona of that guy it's it's something else that the people who bought it from him came up with um, so that was really interesting because that ties into a lot of the entrepreneurship books that I've been reading and talking about how um, Colonel Sanders, you know, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, that he didn't get his break till 65 and he was pitching um, his recipe and got told no hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times and finally someone caught on to it and, um, and realized that he had something special and ran with it. And so that was pretty awesome or it was nice to make those connections. You know, this whole entire process has been about making connections. <clears throat> one of the things that I really want to reiterate, especially because it's episode 50, is, is one, why I'm doing this. Dispersing the cloud um, came from me and my buddy Joseph, Joey Wren, who lives out in um, Southern California and he is 
a physical therapist. He's a physical therapist now, but when we met, uh, we were both just personal trainers at UFC gym. And as we would try to have conversations, the longer we worked at UFC gym and we're getting massively shredded, uh, we noticed that we were turning into lunks. We were turning into, and there's nothing wrong with being a lunk. I'm actually on a, I think I'm sick. No, not 16. I might be 16 weeks in right now to uh, getting back into shape and I'm back to being shredded and it's awesome. Um, but we were lifting constantly and we weren't reading, we weren't growing. And the way that Joey described it, he described it as this cloud coming in. It's like this gray cloud and just consuming your thoughts and you were stuttering and you couldn't put things together. And, and I had just come off a master's degree and he had just come off of um, going through his undergrad as well as doing all his PT certification at the same time. So we, we had just come from an environment where we were engulfed in knowledge and we were moving to an environment where we were supposed to take that knowledge and put it to practice, but the practice was very um, narrow in scope. You know, we're lifting weights, we're telling other people how to lift weights. You don't really need much brain capacity to do that. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing that and doing it well and being a great physical trainer uh, and a personal trainer, but the narrowness of the scope made the other aspects of our brains almost shut down or get the cloud. And it's really kind of cool to be on episode 50 and to see how much knowledge um, I was able to consume, regurgitate, and retain through the course of this year. We're only a few few weeks left here in December and, and the year will be over and um, I'll have accomplished my goal of 60 books in a year and um, looking, I can't, I'm going to wait to reflect on that till we hit uh, the end of the year. But it is a very, I just kind of wanted to touch on that um, because it's episode 50 and then again to touch on me reading books that necessarily like uh, pot liquor, um, poppers, it doesn't necessarily get me a lot of insight um, into things that I hadn't, it's a book on food, you know, but it's bringing to remembrance a lot of the books that I read throughout the year. And we talked about the principle of when ideas stick, you know, you have to hear something four times, you have to read something four times um, before it really stands out to you. And the idea that most Americans are reading one to two books a year and two is stretching it, right? If you're reading two or three books, I'll, I'll give someone who's, we'll say they're well read, they're reading four books a year. Well, it usually takes you to hear four, something four times before you make a connection. So you would have to read um, four books on money that year for you to connect dots and make some advancements in money. In, your, in the way that you perceive, in the way that you use, in the way that you operate within money. Unfortunately, that's not how we work. We read one book on money, we need one book on relationships, one book on spirituality, and then we read one book for fun. Maybe if we're reading a lot for your average American, right? Four is quite a bit for most people. So we're not making any connections in that, in that year. I Being able to read or go through, you know, with technology, you don't even have to read now, but being able to go through so many different books in a year, and um, Charles Duhigg says that Bigger, Faster, Stronger, says that you need to read it, write it, regurgitate it, or teach it to someone before you retain it. So I'm reading it, I'm hearing it, um, I'm regurgitating it to you, and in some cases I'm taking notes and I'm physically writing it, so some of these things are actually sticking. The cool thing is I'm reading four to six books a month. So I'm making connections. Probably every 20 books I read, I make maybe two big connections. Um, maybe three or four, depending on um, the sequence, you know, if it's if it's the same topic. Like I said, I just read about Colonel Sanders. Um, this is probably the third time. So I kind of have his story down a little bit, but it hasn't really stuck in my head um, the way that the lessons from Rich Dad, Poor Dad or Richest Man in Babylon had stuck in my head. You know, I'm starting to get those down very pat um, because I've gone through those two books multiple times in this year. 
Um, but it's very interesting that I'm able to read something like pot liquor um, poppers and pull from those different stories um, throughout other books that I've read and make some connections. I noticed a little bit of a connection um, there from, I, again, I don't know where I first read about Colonel Sanders um, and him making his big break. Uh, but one of the things I did re did kind of get from it, um, and I again, this is only the second time that I've heard this. Once was in Economics in One Lesson, um, and the other one was in this book. It was talking about, oh God, I can't even place it. I just remember the light clicking during it, and I didn't take notes during during this book uh, because, again, I'm just having, I'm struggling having time uh, to actually do the, the listening and, and do the note taking because it was drive time and now it's physical labor time so I can hear it I just don't have time to, to stop what I'm doing and take the notes um, but it had to do it had to do with government entities controlling oh pff, boom cloud left this is what it was so when slaves were working the fields right um, they basically were providing the ability for those fields to even produce a return on investment. When you have free labor like that, right? When you have free labor, it makes everything possible, right? You don't have to pay for it. So cotton, before the cotton gin, was profitable to go out and pick it. Without the cotton gin, right, it wasn't profitable. When slavery became abolished, a lot of these um, slave farms and plantations could no longer operate. And then the cotton gin came along and then they could, right? Because um, when you don't have that free labor, you had to come up with something. Um, this was actually, now I remember where I heard it from. This was Frederick Douglass's um, autobiography, which is one of the top 10 from the year. Uh, so if you need a book to read, check out Frederick, Frederick Douglass's memoirs or his autobiography. Anyway, um, this whole concept of the slaves keeping these things alive what I found out in this book, uh, Pot Liquor Poppers, is that the government actually came in and bailed the plantations out by subsidizing them. Um, and this kicks back to economics in one lesson. If you're talking about a free market or you're talking about a government-controlled market, the African Americans who had been freed and basically wanted they said hey we work this land this land should be ours to buy but the government has come in and bailed them out and subsidized them this is a huge problem if those if those markets are allowed to die then some of the skilled african american workers who know the land and know the job can come in and buy up these things for very small portions. Now, they might need investors now, right? Because they just were freed. But it was a very interesting insight to the way that politics works today. You have majority of African Americans and majority of my people, Latinos, I know I look white, um, of Mexicans and immigrants saying that, I mean, not saying, but they usually vote Democrat. And yet... It's those type of systems that in the past, according to this book, they were most upset about. We saw it in 2008 when the government came and bailed out the banks. Now the banks, you can look at the banks and say, oh, evil corporations, evil corporations. But if those corporations would have just been allowed to fail, other corporations and other banks and other, other entities that aren't corrupt would have taken their place instead of having government subsidize or bail out or come and save what it ends up doing is actually ends up hurting those people it ends up hurting those people who were slaves who were able to work the land um, I, I believe their complaint in the book was there's no land to work there's no land to buy there's no land to work the government should give us their land i would argue instead of making two wrongs don't make a right, I would argue that the government just needs that land. They just need to stay out of it. 
let the landowners fail because they can't do it without free labor. And when they go bankrupt, the bank has to sell to somebody, right? And nobody's going to do it if they don't have free labor and don't understand the industry. I just thought that was an interesting um, connection that I got to make. And that was like three or four different books all connected. Now, again, if I'm only reading three or four books a year, the chances that I read Economics in One Lesson, uh, Pot Liquor Poppers, Frederick Douglass's autobiography, and how what would be, I don't know what the fourth one was. Again, I'm still making connections. But I found that to be really interesting, and that was one of the big aha moments I got from this book. Uh, let me explain what pot liquor actually is. So pot liquor is basically they're, they're stemming all southern food from pot liquor. Pot liquor was the um, broth and the stuff left over after they cooked meals for their slave owners. And ironically enough, the pot liquor, um, we know this now to be true, the pot liquor actually had all the nutrients and the good stuff in it. And um, the food that they were cooking, basically all the nutrients were cooked out of it. And that's what was left in the pot. And so that's how these slaves would survive. And someone who comes from a very religious background, and even the book mentioned it as almost like a religiosity type of manifestation manifestation to it is that was God's way of giving those people everything that they needed from something that is completely horrible. Um, they referenced it to manna from heaven. Um, if you guys don't know the, the story in the Bible about um, literally manna falling from heaven to the children of Israel who were wandering the desert, it basically wasn't good food. It was just enough to keep them alive. It was every nutrient they needed to keep them alive. Um, you can argue if that's history or if that's fairy tale, but the reference was made, so that's why I'm bringing it up. Um, but it was really quite amazing that um, from something really horrible, the slave owners think they're giving them the shaft when really they're getting everything they actually really need. Um, all I mean, it, and it is an interesting book because it walks you through the entire movement uh, from slave to freed to now. So you go from like, oh man, I'm going to get my dates all messed up, but I'm getting better at dates from doing all this reading. So let's see if I can kind of go um, a little bit. We're talking the like 1910 maybe? 1910, 1920, 1930, 40, 50s. And then 60s, we have um, civil rights movement, um, and then it takes you to 70s and 80s. So um, I think they, the book starts in the 20s. Uh, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Um, read the book. Check it out. Tell me I'm wrong. It'd be awesome. All in all, amazing book, um, and I didn't get as much out of it because I wasn't able to take notes. But I thought it was pretty cool, and I learned a lot about Southern cooking. I didn't retain as much as I normally do, but I'm just pumped that I'm still doing these videos uh, a year later. So, kiss it. Um, coming up next week, and again, this is a short video. Uh, coming up next week, um, again, more private work. I'm trying to figure out how that's going to affect my game plan for my move. Oh, oh, I got approved. Um, I submitted my um, timeline to um, United Methodist uh, Church and uh, Memorial United Methodist Church in Farmington, Missouri, and they approved it. So uh, the way that it looks right now is I will be um, playing one service in February, one in, I'm sorry, one in January, one in February, two in March, two in April, May. Um, I will be living in Farmington, Missouri, actually probably more likely St. Louis, Missouri and commuting to Farmington for the part-time music gig. But um, a lot of things, a lot of things still will happen. Um, up, I mean, it's a lot of time. It's six months from now, basically, uh, before I'm officially there. Could happen sooner. We'll see. There's a lot of things in play. <clears throat> this is kind of, this is kind of cool. Um, talking about being... I think I mentioned it in the last video, talking about being very mobile and being very malleable. 
Um, I, I joke with my buddy and my current boss right now, the guy who hooked me up with the fire gig. And fires are on, fires are off. We're doing private work. We're not doing private work. We might never work again. Well, work is abundance. Um, the plan grows and moves and evolves um, as we go. Originally, the plan was January. January 1st, I was moving to Missouri. And it made a lot of sense. And I had this job lined up and I had another job lined up. Um, but when this opportunity came up to work the fires, I had to rework that. Um, because the amount of cash that they're paying me, the amount of money they're paying me is once in a lifetime kind of deal of, I cannot pass it up. Um, because one, you, I go from struggling and, um, being difficult to get my passions off the ground. Or if I sacrifice three or four months of my life working 12 hour days, seven days a week, I literally can go from struggling to buying a house uh, in that three months. And that's what's going to happen if the fires pick back up. I'll buy, um, I'll buy a home in May, um, if not before then. Um, and again, I mean, in my previous episodes, we talked about house hacking, and that's what I'm going to be doing out there is house hacking. So um, I'll most likely be living in a basement while people rent up the upstairs, but I'm trying to create cash flow and, and all the above. <clears throat> and if that doesn't work out, then I'll just go back to um, living in a tiny house like I've always wanted to do anyway. So um, it's just very convenient to be able to move in and out of plans. Um, a lot of times people set plans, and I know most people like to do this. This is my plan, and I'm just going to stick to my plan. There's about 15 to 20 different options and moves um, that can happen within their contingency plans really and they're they're moving and they're um they're think of it as a Venn diagram right but instead of three different circles that intersect in the middle there's like 12 different circles or 15 different circles that intersect in a perfect plan and if one of those things fall out of position that's fine and another one takes its place and the plan is malleable and, and three things could fall out and the plan just looks a little different without this um, there's even, there's even Seattle and New York. Um, they were in those plans before, um, before this timeline got approved. If they didn't approve my timeline, uh, I literally, the next move was Boston. Um, and I was going to move to Boston on January 1st. Um, pending again, fires came into play. So it, it's one of those things where, um, I get a general sense and direction of what I'm supposed to do. And then from there, I develop a plan around what I feel like I'm supposed to do. Um, luckily for me, I mean, like I said, I think I might have talked about this in the last episode. I do, before I do anything, I do a lot of praying and um, I try to get a sense for what I feel like I'm supposed to do. Um, and anybody who does that knows that you don't always get a definite answer. You get a general nudge in a direction. And one of my mentors, Tom LeMaster, has always told me, if you just get the car moving, you just start moving the car, um, God will steer it in the correct direction. And I think he's really doing that for me right now. Um, incredibly, incredibly rough months behind me and probably some rough months ahead of me too. Um, but regardless of those, I've already been so, I've been through so much uh, pursuing this dream and pursuing this passion and I've given up so much already <clears throat> that the times that are very, very difficult and the times that hurt slow me down, but they do not take my eyes off of, um, off of the main purpose and the main goal. I, I mean, I just got so many good things coming on for 2018. Um, all the artwork for um, the owl who asks who. Um, is done. I think I probably have showed you guys that. I showed you last video. By the time you see this, it will be available on Amazon. So um, go to Amazon.com right now if you're watching this and check out um, There's an Owl on Our Car. That's the title of the book. Um, you can look it up under Samuel Fergoza. And um, 
that should be it will be out by the time you see this it's out i mean it comes out in like two weeks so um that's awesome we'll publish another one my invisible friend should be published by the time you see this video uh, i'll release two different songs by the time you see this video um it's very everything's happening like january february of 2018 i'm releasing like two i'm releasing two books releasing three or four songs um and uh I'm moving, I'm merging my business with another business for Fergoza Media. Um, a lot is going on, and I'm still moving forward. All good stuff. Uh, because I was reading uh, Pot Liquor Poppers, it reminded me of a quote that I left you guys with a couple weeks ago, but it's just been in my head. Um, if you If you look at failure like salt... When you take salt out of a meal, no one really wants to eat it. You put too much salt into a meal, it ruins it completely. But a good meal or a good story has the perfect amount of salt or failure. And um, I think failure is important because without it, we don't grow, we don't learn. And um, I've definitely experienced uh, my my failures in this last couple months and some shortcomings and, and all the above, but I think those are the things that make us grow, make us stronger, make us better. I'm going to leave you guys with that. Don't forget the salt in your story. That's all I got for you. I'll talk to you next week.